Hello, my name is Camilla Elliott. I'm a professor of literature and media in the Department of English Literature and Creative Writing at Lancaster University. In my research and teaching, I often use other media forms like book illustrations or film adaptations of books to help me to understand and interpret literature. I've created a series of four interactive workshops about Charles Dickens's A Christmas Carol and the theme of time. And this is to help you with your studies and also to show you some of the approaches you might encounter should you choose to continue studying literature at the university. Part one offered an introduction. This is part two, the lessons of the past. A Christmas Carol was written in 1843. It's a story of time travel, subtitled A Ghost Story of Christmas, Scrooge's past and future haunt his present, while the present Scrooge haunts his past and his future. So everyone's haunting everyone. At the end of the novel, Scrooge vows to continue to live in all three time zones to keep time traveling and apply their lessons. He says, I will live in the past, the present and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. This workshop looks at some of the lessons he learns from haunting the past. It looks at the ghost of Christmas past. It looks at money and emotion. It looks at the past of childhood, the past and the present, and the relationship between the past self and present other people. But it also raises some problems with the lessons of Christmas past. And I just want you to um, hang in there and get to the end because a lot of what we think about Christmas Carol, that it's a lovely story and he learns all these wonderful lessons and he becomes a new person, that isn't really that accurate. So have a look at the problems of the lessons of Christmas past. Other workshops, there's the introduction, which gives um, an introduction to theories of time, Christmas and time, and the historical times in which the book was published. And then we've got the present and the future as parts three and four. OK, let's begin with the spirit of Christmas past. It was a strange figure, like a child, yet not so like a child as an old man viewed through some supernatural medium, which gave him the appearance of having receded from the view and being diminished to a child's proportions. Its hair was white as if with age, and yet the face had not a wrinkle in it. The arms were very long and muscular, but its feet and legs were most delicately formed. It wore a tunic of the purest white, and round its waist was bound a lustrous belt. It held a branch of fresh green holly in its hand, and in contradiction of that wintry emblem, had its dress trimmed with summer flowers. But the strangest thing about it was that from the crown of its head, there sprung a bright clear jet of light by which all this was visible, and it carried um, an extinguisher for a cap. Um, to dull itself. What I'd like you to do is spend some time now answering these questions about that passage. So I want you to think about how does a ghost of Christmas past represent Scrooge's past? What about Scrooge's past is there inside that ghost? Why is it child and old at the same time? What does that mean? Why is it holding winter holly and summer flowers? And why is it fluctuating between dark and light? What does that tell you about the past? And what's this about a jet of light coming out of its head? And why would it carry an extinguisher? So pause the video, write this down, chat with people if you're with other people, discuss these questions. These will help you to write stronger and better essays and have more complex ideas but also just um, teach you critical skills. So go ahead and pause. When you're finished, press play. So I want to share a few of my thoughts. The reason I think that the ghost is so ambivalent and he changes so between opposites is that he represents memory. 
And for Scrooge, it's a memory that contains childhood and old age. Scrooge has lived a long life. Um, the past is linear, yes, but it contains all of the seasons within it. And we have memories of winter and summer. And I think perhaps the darkness and the light represent sad and happy memories, as well as unclear and very vivid memories. They're all things in our memories that are a bit cloudy and they're things that we remember as if we're right there right now. I think the jet from the of light from the ghost's head makes everything visible. It's like a projector for a magic lantern show. Um, and these magic lantern shows, which Dickens definitely went to, they use changing and dissolving views. So you'd go from one image quickly to another. And I think for him, that was a real metaphor of, of memory and memories of the past. At the end of the episode with Scrooge and the ghost of Christmas past, Scrooge can't bear it anymore. And he bears, he, he begs the ghost, please, I can't bear it, don't show him anymore. So this extinguisher is to put out the light when memories become too painful. Okay, so this is John Leach's illustration of the ghost of Christmas past. Leach drew the illustrations for the first edition and it shows Scrooge extinguishing the ghost because he can't bear to see any more memories. But interestingly, it does not show the ghost. I want you to think about, again, pause the video and think about why. Why didn't this illustrate, he shows the other two and we'll be looking at them in other two videos. Why didn't he show the ghost? So um, take a few moments, write it down, discuss your ideas with classmates and when you're ready, carry on. So here are a few thoughts I've had on this question. It seems to me that the ghost would actually be really difficult to draw in this particular style of illustration, if not impossible, because of all the opposites that it holds in tension and because it's constantly fluctuating. But I might be wrong about that. I'm not an artist and you may have some ideas and certainly other illustrators did after this first edition try to show this ghost. So I'd like you just, if you don't mind, take a minute, think about if you were to draw it or to even imagine a drawing, how would you represent it? What kind of media would you use? Would you use film? Would you use animation? Would you use special effects? What would you do? Um, so take some time and then if you have artistic ability, go ahead and try and draw something and see um, what you come up with. After John Leach, people did try to draw the Ghost of Christmas Past, but I think they missed out a lot of Dickens' description. In the illustration on the left, you don't really see any trace of an old man, and she's very fully lit. It's like a young girl who's a fairy, and she's not fluctuating, got very solid outline. There was a stage adaptation in 1916 that did manage to get the child the old man because it used the noted child impersonator, Dame Gwendolyn Flapstock. So we're getting that mix and she looks like a grumpy old man. And she's got the, the dress that's described, a shining belt, a white tunic, and there is an actual candle flaring out of her head. And she has the extinguisher, but she's also kind of fully lit, clearly outlined, doesn't have that moving form. Dickens's description of the ghost, as I mentioned, probably came from Magic Lantern shows. Um, and I think that two animated Disney films have gone some way into capturing the ghost shifting lines pretty well. On the left, we have the ghost in the Muppet Christmas Carol. It's constantly moving in this film, her shape, her lighting, but she never manages to look like an old man. I think the character in the Disney film is actually quite disappointing. Um, doesn't look like a child. It's more like a stripped down, overly, overly literal adaptation of a candle with an extinguisher. And I think like a poor relation to Lumiere in Disney's Beauty and the Beast. But in 3D, I've been told, I have seen this film in 3D, you actually see 
this character uh, suddenly and startlingly appear. So we have now the question, what are the lessons of the past? This is the next section of this video. We're going to look at lessons in the relationship between money and feeling. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, the love of money is the root of all evil. And I'd like you to think about whether you agree with that. Think about what's going on today in the world. Think about whether you agree with that. And again, pause the video if you'd like to discuss it with other people or write down some thoughts and then continue whenever you're ready. In part one, we looked at some specific ways in which the love of money for its own sake resulted in it being piled up and hoarded by people in cartoons, but also by Scrooge, rather than spent, rather than shared. And we saw the enormous suffering, starvation, disease and death that resulted from some people having extra money and hoarding it. And we link that to the hard line that Scrooge takes with the charity collectors in the opening chapter of A Christmas Carol. So we see that his love of money has made him hard. And when he travels into his past, we will see more of this. I'm going to start with one of the final scenes rather than going chronologically, because this is the scene that most informs that question of the love of money being the root of all evil. So one of the visions of Scrooge's past shows the moment when his long term fiance breaks off their engagement. Another idol has displaced me, she says. What idol? A golden one. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion gain engrosses you. The idea that the love of gain and, and having more, more, more money actually blocks out all the other emotions is very strong here. Can even I believe that you would choose a dowerless girl? You who in your very confidence with her weigh everything by gain? I release you with a full heart for the love of him you once were. Now, it's quite melodramatic, but there's a very important point here. Scrooge can't feel romantic emotion for her anymore or anything really for her because it's all been directed to wealth. Because she isn't wealthy, he doesn't value her anymore. Um, and she asks him, would you choose me now? And he doesn't answer. That's damning, damning silence. So after he has revisited this painful scene, he's then shown another scene. Now, interestingly, it's not of his past, even though this is the sequence of the past, he's actually seeing her now in the present and seeing what her life is like. And it's kind of his might have been present if he'd married her in the past. And what it shows her is she's married to a very generous husband who's bought so many gifts for Christmas that he needs a porter to help carry them. They have a large brood of children, and yet they have plenty of money. They're not badly off. The scene shows that love and money can exist together, but only when money is spent, not hoarded. I want you to pause and read this passage to yourself now. And um, then when you're ready, I have a few more comments to make. One of the daughters looks like her. And this reminds Scrooge of her youthful beauty and grace and that there are emotions and that there are things in life to value other than money. Now we're going to think about the past of childhood. This is the personal past and it plays an absolutely vital role in the lessons that Scrooge learns the lessons of the past. Scrooge has to go much farther back than his relationship with Belle to discover his childhood emotions. Okay, this is a theory of psychological development. It's very common in therapy that you need to go back to your childhood to understand where things went wrong and release those emotions and feel those emotions again. And that this is the key to mental health. I don't know whether you agree with that or not, but that's still very prominent today. And here it is in A Christmas Carol. 
For Dickens, the idea was larger than this, though. It's not just going back to your childhood to bring about your own healing and your own psychological well-being, but also so that he's able to create healthy, constructive connections with society and with other people, whether that's in personal relationships or in more generally giving to people less fortunate than himself. So Scrooge reconnects with some very happy childhood emotions in the revisiting of his childhood days. Um, here he sees his old school friends and he rejoiced beyond all bounds to see them. And even his cold eye of old age and his heart leapt up as they went past. And he filled with gladness when he heard them give each other Merry Christmas. He was so angry with Fred for saying Merry Christmas and, and thought he should be boiled with his Christmas pudding and have a steak through his heart. But here he reconnects with how he felt when people said Merry Christmas in the past. And then he also reconnects to how much he enjoyed reading um, Ali Baba, uh, a legendary figure. And then significantly, he remembers how much love he felt for his sister, Fan. Uh, and, and again, so these emotions, joy and pleasure, uh, which he's lost sight of. But although he reconnects with happy memories, there are also sad memories. And you think about the ghost being dark and light. And he comes to feel compassion for his child self as though he's a separate being from his adult self. This is a very important step in learning to feel compassion for other people. A lonely boy was reading near a feeble fire and Scrooge sat down upon a form and wept to see his poor forgotten self as he used to be. Being able to see yourself as if you are somebody else and feel for that then helps you to have more compassion for others. He said in pity for his former self, poor boy, and cried again. So the most important lesson that he learns from the past is the, to be able to start feeling for people in the present who are not him, but with whom he can now identify having revisited his own childhood suffering. Here's the child past, changing the way he felt about a child that he encountered in the present that day. I wish, Scrooge muttered after he sees his pity for his former self, and it's too late now. What's the matter, asked the spirit, nothing, nothing. There was a boy singing a Christmas carol. I should have liked to have given him something, that's all. And importantly here, the response to feeling sympathy is to actually want to give the child money. Now, this child was going around singing in an attempt to raise money, but we're already seeing an important connection between caring for other people and spending money and sharing money. There are other past scenes that make him reconsider his present relationships. This scene of his sister coming to take him home from school makes him reconsider his relationship to her son, Fred, who he'd been very cross with the day before. When he sees himself as a young apprentice at a festive Christmas party hosted by his employer, he starts to think, I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk, that's Bob Cratchit. And as we see at the end, he's starting to think about sharing more money with Bob Cratchit as a result of feeling an identification with him. So in a way, it's kind of like spending money on himself vicariously uh, here in these scenes. So let's summarize what we've learned so far, but this isn't the end. It's really important to get to consider some problems with the lessons that Scrooge learns in the past. But first, let's think about what these lessons are. Okay, so hoarding money, leads to an impoverished life materially because he hoards it from himself too, relationally and emotionally. Lesson number one. Lesson number two, hoarding money leads to hoarding emotions and actually losing the ability to feel for anything except for money and to connect to other people. But feeling emotion for your own self in the past allows you to then identify with others who resemble that past self in the present. 
lesson number three. Now number four. And when you identify with others, it leads you to loosen the purse strings, share money with others. There's another problem in the book. So in the scene where we see Belle happily married, the children there, they're middle class children, they're incredibly violent with a working class porter in their impatience and greed to get it, their Christmas presents. And if you look at the words I've highlighted here, words like onslaught, despoil, pommel and kick, they're physically violent with this man. And it kind of creates a scene of violent plunder and pillaging. And it reminds me of, you know, some of the slides we looked at in our first workshop where the middle classes are exploiting and abusing the working classes. And it casts these children as greedy, abusive, middle class capitalists in the making, abusing the one working class figure in the room with them and demanding that he produce their luxuries. So there is a little bit of a shadow here. Now, Dickens thinks it's hilariously funny when you've got horribly badly behaved children, um, but it isn't. Okay, so other workshops, I've mentioned uh, part one, part three, part four, and these discuss further tensions between classes in, in different timelines. If you'd like to read more, study more, here are some further resources. Here are the credits for the images if you need to take a closer look. And here are yet more places where you can look at the images more closely and find more about them. We have a thank you for watching, listening and participating. If you're interested in learning more about what it's like to study English at university or creative writing, start with our website and please feel free to contact us with questions.